today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we measure zoo animal behaviour and why and how we do it. So I like to begin my talks with a bit of background information about myself. Um, so especially when I've got students in the room who are always interested about you know, how to get a job in the future and how I got my role at the zoo. Um, so I actually conducted an undergraduate degree at the University of Liverpool um, well, quite a long time ago now, probably longer ago than I'd like to admit. Um, but I studied for zoology and evolution psychology. And actually, uh, this is where my relationship with Chester Zoo really started. I actually completed my dissertation on these two species here. So we've got Sulawesi macaques and lion tailed macaques. And I was interested in their be play behaviour. Um, I was absolutely fascinated by animal behaviour from a very young age. And I kind of really just took this when I went to university. Um, but since then, uh, things got a little bit more feathery rather than furry. Um, so since then, I've really kind of studied birds most of my life. Um, so after I finished my undergraduate degree, I actually worked for RSPB for a couple of years at the Nature Reserve in Conway. And I went on to study for a Master of Research in Biodiversity and Conservation at the University of Leeds. Um, and I completed two um, projects at Leeds. So the first of which was looking at avian malaria in yellow hammers, which is uh, this bird here, really beautiful yellow bird. And then I was really lucky enough to go out to Malaysia and Borneo to study um, the effects of logging on bird diversity as well. So this is a picture of me out in the field. Um, always looks glamorous and always definitely isn't. Um, after I finished my MRes, I went on to conduct a PhD at Liverpool John Moores University on these amazing birds. So these are Gouldian finches. The most fascinating thing about them is that these are the exact same species, but they come in two different morphs. So a red-headed morph and a black-headed morph. After that, I went back to work for the RSPB for two years as a conservation scientist at their headquarters in Sandy in Bedfordshire, where I studied this bird here, which is a little tern, a seabird along the coast of the UK. And then I actually joined um, Chester Zoo in 2015 as their scientific officer, where I facilitated a lot of the research that the zoo does. And then about a year and a half ago, I changed roles uh, to focus more on animal behavior research. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So hands up who's been to a zoo in their lives. Hey, lots of hands. So you guys, I don't need to tell you guys what a zoo is, um, but I'm going to give you a little, a tiny, tiny quick history lesson about zoos in general. Um, you can see here, this is a bit of a schematic about kind of the way zoos have progressed um, in the last couple of centuries. Um, actually, the first real scientific zoo was London Zoo, which was opened in 1928. Um, this was kind of at the height of the Victorian era. They were obsessed with collecting and documenting the natural world. And this is what we see here, that zoos are seen kind of more as a menagerie or a living natural history cabinet. It was really about people going out there collecting animals and bringing them back to the UK. Then times changed a little bit, so into the um, earlier 20th century, the idea changed that zoos should be more of zoological parks. And this kind of started really from Germany, um, was kind of a guy there who opened up, um, I can't remember the name of the zoo now, but they, it was the first real zoo to have dioramas, rather than just kind of having animals in cages, they had big dioramas, amazing exhibits that look really exciting. And the focus of this was kind of on um, the ecology of the animals. And then moving on really towards, you know, to today, really into the 21st century, zoos really now are conservation centres. So that's actually the aim of zoos really across the world. Obviously, there is a whole scope and different range of zoos, um, but we like to think that Chester Zoo is one of the ones at the forefront of this con conservation initiative. Chester Zoo really does push the conservation message a lot. Our mission is preventing extinction, and we can do that in a number of ways. Um, first of all, obviously, Chester Zoo is a place where people can come and have a good time, so it's a recreational facility. But alongside that, we really want people to learn about the natural world as well, and kind of, and to be able to um, take home ways in which they can change their behaviour to become more biodiversity friendly. But we're also um, a conservation institution and also a research institution as well. And that's kind of where my role really sits, kind of thinking about how we can improve the captive husbandry of our animals and how we can, um, how we can improve the conservation. So at Chester Zoo, we have kind of six main kind of research themes, um, which are up here on the board. Um, I'm probably going to talk to you today about two of these, because I don't have time to go into all six. And this is kind of where my work mostly fits. So we've got conservation, breeding and management here and wildlife health and well-being. Now, working in a zoo is incredibly exciting. I get to work with a huge number of really interesting species. I get to spend a lot of time with animals, especially those that might be really difficult to see and study in the wild. So that's a really good pro of doing research in zoos. You can observe an animal 24 hours a day. 
you can't really do that very well in the field, or very easily in the field, especially for some, you know, really shy or cryptic species. Um, another pro is that um, just the complete range of taxa that we have within the collection as well, it can be amazing. Unfortunately, there are quite a few cons to conducting research in zoos. Generally, we struggle with small sample sizes, um, so obviously we've only got a handful of potentially of different individuals. You know, there's only so much you can do with two rhinos, but it still is, can be really important, especially for that individual animal's welfare to, to conduct research with that animal. Um, another kind of con to working in zoos is there's a lack of replicas as well. So one enclosure definitely isn't like another one, especially even when you're working across multiple zoos. And also things change very quickly in zoos as well. Animals move into the collection, out of the collection as part of the breeding programs as well. So there's nothing worse than getting halfway through your study and then your animal leaves the zoo. It's never helpful. So there are lots of kind of difficult ways as well to working with zoos, but there's ways that we can get around it as well. So what do I do? What is my role at Chester? So I'm behaviour officer. So I work with our, in our applied science team. Um, and my small team is headed up by Dr. Lisa Holmes, who is our behaviour and welfare scientist. And between us, we run the behaviour and welfare programme at the zoo. And really, we work really closely with the animal curators and animal teams. I don't really get to answer my own research questions. All our questions are driven by the needs of the animal collection, trying to answer real management decisions. So we're using our science in a really applied way. So things like, um, why aren't my rhinos breeding? We can help kind of give a little bit, bit more information about that, or you know, why isn't my cassowary using all of its enclosure, or something like that. And this is just an example of the array of some of the species I'm working on at the moment. I could be working on one thing one day, and then another thing the next day. I could be doing a really short snapshot study over a couple of days, all the way through to longitudinal year-long or multi-year studies as well. Um, so I know I'm speaking to a room of potentially not animal biologists, so I just wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about what animal welfare is and how we kind of study animal welfare in zoos. So there's a number of definitions of animal welfare out there, but this one is my favourite. So animal welfare is the collective physical, mental and emotional states of an animal over a period of time. And this can be measured on a scale from poor to good. And the animal can move up and down that scale throughout its lifetime, depending on what conditions it's facing at that time. Now, an animal experiencing good welfare is well nourished, it's safe, it's secure, it is in kind of a species typical social group, it's able to exhibit species typical behaviours. And that's kind of what we're really looking for in our zoos. We want them to be at this end of the, of the scale here. But lots of things can affect an animal's welfare, so where the animal sits on that spectrum really can, um, a number of things can affect it. Uh, the first of which is individual history um, or individual kind of different identities. This is something I'm really interested in. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this in a second. But all animals within the zoo all have a specific individual history. They've not all been through the same things in their lives, and this affects where they sit on that, um, that welfare scale. Um, so this here is a hundred dictic, and obviously a hundred animal will be completely different to a parent reared animal. So that's an example of how, how an individual history might differ. We also need to take into account species natural history as well. So animals kind of live in different social groups, they live in different habitats, they eat different things, and this can all affect an animal's welfare within captivity. And then finally, it's the things that we actually do that can affect an animal's welfare. So how the animal's looked after, what sort of enclosures it's in, what, is it's, what do we feed it, um, what sort of enrichment devices do we give it, is it in a mixed species exhibit, what species is it next to, all of these things will affect an animal's welfare. And these are things that are all under our control. These two things really are not under our control. Well, maybe individual history is, potentially, um, but animal management is the one thing that we have a great deal of control over. And that's the things we can change to improve welfare. Um, so how do we actually measure welfare within a zoo? So welfare is basically how an animal is feeling. I don't know about you guys, but I cannot talk to an animal and ask how it's feeling. I would make my job a lot easier, but I'd probably not have a job anymore. Um, so how do we actually measure welfare? So a welfare status is fed into by its, uh, an animal's mental domain, so how it's feeling. But there's a lot of ways in which we can actually measure how the animal is feeling, and there's a couple of examples at the top here. So here we've got nutrition, so whether or not um, we're giving the appropriate food and make sure it's available, is the animal eating the food? Um, you know, we've got its environment as well. Does it have an appropriate environment? Are we providing it with the things that it needs in life? Its physical health, is it fit and able? Is it free of disease and injury? And then it's the one that I'm interested in here, which is the behavior. So is the animal producing species typical behaviors? So. 
I'm just going to touch a little bit on some work I did for my PhD, um, insofar as not all animals are the same. This might sound obvious to you guys, especially if anyone's had pets in their lives, you know that one animal is not the same as another animal. But actually, scientists really only grasped this fact, especially in behavioral ecology, not, uh, not that long ago. Um, I was actually interested in personality in particular, and this is a, a graph I've got from my PhD, which is looking at personality differences in Ghoulie and Finches. So you can see our two colour morphs here, so we've got a red-headed bird and a black-headed bird, and this graph shows that red-headed birds are significantly more aggressive than red-headed birds. This isn't actually that dissimilar, um, or that unusual really in nature, because red is really seen as a signal of aggression. But what's really interesting is that the black-headed birds are also really different from the red-headed birds. So here we've got two different personality types. So we've got exploration. So object neophilia is um, a measure of fearfulness of a novel object. So this is where you, you put kind of a novel object in with the, in, um, the bird's enclosure and you see how long it takes them to go and explore it. And then we've got risk taking down here as well. So this is the time a bird took back to return to a feeder once I scared it with a fake plastic hawk. I had a really great time during my PhD. Um, so here we've got our red-headed birds and black-headed birds, and we can see that our black-headed birds are significantly quicker than red-headed birds in exploring a novel object. Not only that, they also take more risks, so they head back to a feeder quicker than red-headed birds. So this just goes to show that you need to treat animals differently. You even need to treat animals as individuals, especially when we're thinking about welfare. So I'm going to move on to a couple of examples that, um, of specific research projects we've done within the zoo. These are just a handful of all the many hundreds of projects we've completed, but I thought I'd just give you a snapshot of a couple of different ones. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we promote natural behaviour within our animals. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about enrichment. Um, does anybody know what enrichment is? Have you heard the term before? Some of you are nodding a little bit. So, in well, yeah, there's some zoo people over there who will definitely should know what enrichment is. But enrichment is a way in which we can promote natural behaviours. Normally, that's through something like a device or a way in which we can change the environment to encourage natural behaviours. So, the provision of enrichment generally improves fitness and well-being. It encourages natural behaviours. It increases activity levels. So, rather than just having, having kind of a barren environment, it reduces stereotypic behaviours. Um, so, for those of you who don't know what stereotypic behaviour is, it's normally kind of a repetitive behaviour, not seen to have any function, and can can be seen as a sign of poor welfare. And here at the bottom, I've got three reptile species. So we've got um, Komodo dragons here, we've got emerald tree lizards here, and we've got a Salvador's monitor lizard here. Now, historically, people didn't think that reptiles were intelligent enough to require enrichment. They thought all reptiles need is some heat lamps and then some food, and that's all they need. But hopefully you all kind of realise that reptiles have a little bit more to them than that, and actually enrichment is really important for their well-being in captivity. So uh, we set up a project looking at different types of enrichment for these three different species to see which ones would work best for them. Um, I did have a really nice video here. Unfortunately, some of my videos aren't quite working. But if you can imagine this emerald tree lizard here, and this is a terrestrial feeder. It's a bamboo with like holes drilled in it, and there's some food in there. If you can imagine that emerald tree lizard feeding in there, that would be great. So uh, these are the results of this project. Um, so we've got our three different lizard species along the bottom here. We've got our activity of the side here, so the percentage of time they spent active. And then we've got our different enrichment trials along the bottom here. So here we've got our Komodo dragon. And the control level of activity is around 10%, so not hugely active. And then we've got our three different types of enrichment. So a scent trail, that'll be something like, I don't know, something really gross, like a bag of rotted meat that's been dragged around the enclosure. They love that. Um, furnishings, different piles of leaves, different logs, that sort of things to engage with. And a scent pile, similar, something like something gross and rotted in like a pile of leaves or something. We can see here that our Komodo dragon really enjoyed all of these different enrichment types. It significantly increased their activity levels for each of these, but the scent pile was obviously the favorite. And then we've got our emerald tree lizard here. So our control level was about 30%, so already a little bit higher than the Komodo dragon. Um, but you can see here that, according to this, the hanging feeder was definitely the favourite. Actually, interestingly, this goes back to individual differences in animals within zoos. This result here was basically based on one of our pair. So this guy down here is our male. The video that I was going to show you is actually our female. She's got severe arthritis, and she actually couldn't engage with the hanging feeder at all because she couldn't climb. So it just goes to show you need to make sure you take into account individual differences of your animals. 
And then finally, oh, what happened to all Salvador's monitor lizard? Um, kind of looks like nothing really worked for it here. Um, really low activity levels for each of our enrichment types. Um, but actually, this, um, this kind of experiment was done around lunchtime-ish. And actually, anecdotally, the student actually found that this animal was actually engaging a lot with the enrichment later on in the day. So we need to repeat this um, with looking at kind of the effect of time of day on enrichment trials as well. So hopefully, the Salvador's monitor will be able to be enriched with something, but maybe just at a different time. So moving on, I'm going to talk to you about how we ensure our animals are in the correct environments for them to thrive. Um, and this is this project I've done recently on radiated tortoises. So this is a species from southern Madagascar. They're critically endangered. In fact, all Chelonian species in Madagascar are critically endangered. It's a really, really horrible situation for these species. So it's really important that we are keeping them in zoos and that we're keeping them properly and breeding them as well. So um, this is a graph here of temperature. And this is in southern Madagascar. I don't know if you guys can quite see. But the red line is the maximum temperature these tortoises are exposed to in their native range. And then the blue line is the minimum temperature. So it ranges between 19 and 30 degrees. So it's relatively stable. So these are the sort of things we want to be replicating in captivity. So this was a project that I did with the keepers. They were a bit concerned, with, especially with some of our juvenile radiated tortoises, that they really weren't very active. And they were concerned that they actually their enclosure was the wrong temperature. Um, so this is just a quick pie chart of their activity levels, of specifically of the juvenile tortoises I was studying. Um, so you can see here they're spending 90% of their time basking and only 7% of their time foraging. And this is kind of indicating that they're probably not quite hot enough. So as part of this study, I decided to stick some data loggers on my tortoises. Um, I do weird stuff like that. Um, in order to uh, record the temperature of their carapace, and I also monitored their behavior as well. Um, they actually, um, we decided to move these tortoises to an area of increased heat provision to see if this would have an effect on their temperature and also their behavior. And you can see from these two graphs, so these graphs are the temperature change before and after they moved enclosures to an area of improved heat provision. We can see here that on both of our different types of data logger, so one was dorsal, so one was on the top of the tortoise, the other one was marginal, one was at the edge. We can see that there was a significant increase in temperature after they moved um, enclosures. And we can see it's kind of getting to the sort of temperatures that we want to see the tortoises being at. So between, you know, it kind of peaking at around 30 degrees here. And then finally, looking at their behavior, uh, we can see that after the enclosure move, they spent significantly more time foraging and significantly less time basking. So this is just evidence to show that the enclosure move really, really worked for these individuals um, and that now they were kind of experiencing um, an environment closer to what you would expect in the wild. So um, who's been to Chester Zoo? Hey. <laughs> Brilliant. Nearly everybody. Okay, so three years ago, we opened up a whole new area of the zoo called Islands. It's based on uh, six different Southeast Asian islands. And this was a really unique opportunity as me as a behavior scientist because a number of species moved enclosures within the zoo. And so it was a really great way to see if this enclosure move had a really positive impact on the individual, so whether or not it actually worked for them. So this was a study that was done by one of our students. I'm going to focus on one of the species I studied, which was Sumatran orangutans. Um, so this is our, some of our Sumatran orangutans here. So we had seven individuals move um, enclosures from their old realm of the red ape enclosure to their new enclosure in monsoon forest and islands. And one of the um, really nice impacts of moving to this purpose-built enclosure was a significant increase in positive social behavior of three of our individuals. Um, so this is a really nice positive behavioral result from moving enclosure. Um, not only that, but after moving um, all the, well, four of the seven orangutans actually Im improved in their visibility to members of the public as well. So visibility is obviously something that's really important for the zoo because when you visit a zoo, you want to be able to see the animals. Um, and having an increase in visibility and not a compromise in an animal's welfare is a really positive result for this kind of exhibit. So um, moving on to my kind of final two examples, um, I'm going to go back to my favorite things, which are birds. Um, and this is kind of two projects that we've been doing looking at breeding behaviors in particular. Um, the first of which is looking at two species of critically endangered Southeast Asian songbirds. So we've got the beautiful Javan green magpie here, and then the also, maybe not quite as beautiful, but still really nice, Sumatran laughing thrush here. 
Now, unfortunately, a lot of Southeast Asian songbirds are critically endangered, mostly due to the domestic bird trade, which is absolutely rife in Southeast Asia. It really is a conservation crisis. The forests are really falling silent because birds are being poached from the wild to take part in song contests. Um, so it's a really sad situation. It's something the zoo is really pushing at the moment. Um, and actually, it's really important that these two critically endangered species have a sustainable population within zoos, so hopefully one day they can be reintroduced back into the wild. So these two bird species are really elusive. We know probably very little about them. In fact, the John Green Magpie, the um, individuals we, got in the, we have in the zoo, were actually uh, rescued from the bird trade in Indonesia, and they are the only ones in captivity in the whole of Europe. Um, so we knew nothing about them when they came to the zoo, so it was really important that we started documenting some of their behaviors to help us improve their kind of sustainability and captivity. Um, so we used remote cameras, so we've kind of got like a big CCTV system set up within our parrot house. Um, there we go. Um, within our parrot house, um, yeah, kind of like big brother for birds. Um, I did have a video here, but I'm not, it's not working unfortunately. Um, but if you can imagine, this is the first time I ever recorded birds mating on camera. So yeah, and it's not working unfortunately. I'm not going to act that out for anyone. Um, so, uh, some of the results of these projects. So, looking at Java and Green Magpies, we were looking at the, their breeding behaviour in particular. So, we found that, um, kind of not surprisingly, that the females really were the main caregiver. So, we found that um, they spent significantly longer brooding the chicks and incubating eggs as well, and the male would be the one that would bring them food. Interestingly, for this much in laughing thrush, we see something quite different. So actually, um, it's the males that actually tended to incubate the eggs longer than the females. So this was kind of more of an equal kind of parenting in this, this species, which wasn't really known before. So this information is feeding into the best practice guidelines for both these species. And now I'm going to move on um, to my final um, example, which is one of my favorite species in the zoo. This is a southern cassowary. These are incredible animals. They are birds. They are bigger than me. They are enormous. They are really scary. They've got one massive great claw that could disembowel you if they wanted to. Um, so you don't want to get too close. Um, but we've got a pair within the zoo. These pa this pair moved to islands um, alongside a lot of other animals, like I mentioned earlier. And actually, they decided to mix these birds for the first time. We've never bred cassowaries at Chester Zoo. And in fact, they're known to be really difficult to breed. We know very little about their behavior. For such a big bird, they're incredibly elusive in the wild as well. So this is, um, this is the pair that's been mixed. You can see here, this is our female. She's huge. And our male, bless him, he's pretty tiny. You can imagine how scary that must have been for him to be mixed with her. She's uh, quite a monster. Um, but yeah, so we, we mixed them for the first time, hoping to record their breeding behaviors and basically their courtship behaviors because it's never been documented before. Uh, so to do that, we monitored their visual cues for mixing, so to make sure that you know, they are ready to be mixed. To be honest, that female could kill that male if we mix them at the wrong time, so we need to really make sure we know what we're doing. We were looking at courtship behavior between the pair, we were looking at any attempted mating attempts, and any sort of brooding behavior we might see as well. Um, at Chester Zoo, we're actually really lucky that we have an endocrinology laboratory on site as well, so we can monitor our animals' reproductive and adrenal hormones. Um, so we decided to do this with our cassowary pair. So we measured hormone levels, and we can do this non-invasively through fecal samples as well. So we can collect individual fecal samples from our animals, and we can actually measure their reproductive hormones, um, which is really useful for management purposes. So we collected individual samples for two to three um, per week per animal. We looked at progesterone levels in the female and testosterone levels in the male. And hopefully this video will work. Oops. So this is a video of our female cassowary. She's sat down here and this is our male. So this is the sort of behavior we're seeing. It's incredibly subtle. You can see here this posture here. You can see with the head, this is her exhibiting to the male, I'm ready to be mated. And oh look, he's just he's not even paying attention. Um, but this is the sort of thing we were documenting how regularly she sat for the male when the male attempted to mate her. And um, yeah, you can see here, this wasn't such a great attempt. He's just like, oh, what are you doing? She's just like, come on. But no, <laughs> unfortunately not, not successful that time. But he's got so much better the last couple of years. He definitely knows what he's doing now, which is good. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, we haven't had any successful breeding from this pair yet, but we really are hoping in the future. Um, we've changed their diet a little bit, so we're hoping that that might actually have a positive impact as well. Hopefully, she'll be able to lay eggs at some point. So, looking
looking at their reproductive hormones. Uh, you can see here that this is the first time we've ever really done this as well, so it was validated in our lab. You can see this is levels of testosterone up on the, um, the axis here, and then we've got pre-season courtship and mating behaviours here. We can see a really nice increase in testosterone throughout the breeding season here. We see something similar for the females' progesterone levels too. And then finally, this is something I'm really interested in, is thinking about vocalizations and cassowaries. They're an incredibly territorial animal. They are solitary in the wild, so how do they communicate with each other? So we think they produce these really loud calls. With the male, we can hear them. He's, he has a really loud call. But with the female, she produces a call that we can't actually hear. So, I think this one work. So this is our female cassowary. She's about to produce an infrasonic vocalization. I now know that they are infrasonic because we've put vocal or we've put recorders in there, and we've um, been working with Salvino de Court from Manchester Metropolitan University, who has actually, um, you can see here, this is her producing her vocalization. You can see how inflated her air sacs are. She's really going for it. It's really weird because it's completely silent to us, but it's actually infrasonic, and we think this is how they communicate across great, you know, miles of forest between each other as well. So this is really the beginning of this project. We're hoping to do a lot more. We're hoping to work with a lot of other animal collections as well. Oh, she just has a little preen. So great, I'm going to wrap it up there. Oh, it's a beautiful drawing that some one of our uh, students did here. So this is really kind of us documenting their behaviours, and we're hoping this will feed into the best practice guidelines for the species. So yeah, so that's me. I'm going to wrap it up. So that was just a couple of examples of the work that we do at Chester, thinking about how we monitor and measure animal behavior, specifically kind of thinking about animal welfare. If you want to learn a little bit more, you can have a look at our website, which is here, and follow us on Twitter. And then we've also got our 2017 science review, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, so thank you very much. And if we've got time, I'll take some questions.